Hey, how's it going? Welcome to episode two of this series, where I, a Rhea script noob, will attempt to learn scripting in Reaper with a little bit of help from my friends. In episode one, we talked about reading Lua scripts that other people wrote as a way to get familiar with the syntax, as well as how to modify custom scripts that you download from the internet to better suit your personal needs. So today we'll continue where we left off, and with the help of the Reaper API, we're gonna write a few simple Rhea scripts using a number of Rhea scripts functions. And on our way, we're gonna run into a few different types of functions and we're gonna discuss how to use them. So what's a function? Every script is made up of a number of functions. When you run any script, Reaper will read the script from top to bottom from line one. Reaper functions can either run a task for us, like renaming or coloring items and tracks, or they can get us some bit of information that we can later use by other functions in the same script. This can be something quite simple, like the reaper.getCursor position function, which simply communicates the current position of the edit cursor to our script, or they can be more complex functions, like the reaper.getEffects envelope, which can return to us or create an effect envelope based on several arguments that we have to provide. So each function you find in the API takes in zero, one, or any number of arguments. And then after doing its thing, it would return something to us. So you can think of arguments as bits of information we provide to the function so it can do its job. And it does its job by way of returning to us a bit of information or by taking the information it received from us and doing something with it. So if Reaper was able to speak English, a conversation between the author and Reaper would go something like this. I need you to get me the track I selected. Which project is it on? The active project. I see you've selected multiple tracks. Which one should I get? The first one. Got it. To put it simply, every time we ask our script to do something, we are asking the script to return something to us. And every time the script needs extra information to return something to us, it will ask us for an argument. Now Reaper doesn't speak English, so we need to form our questions in a language that it understands. Right now we are looking at Lua, so we need to learn to communicate with our scripts using Lua. And this is where the Reaper API can be really helpful. Let's go over the two functions that I briefly mentioned just now. The Reaper get edit cursor position and the Reaper get effects envelope. Let's start a new script by going to new action, new Rhea script, and let's call this function simply Dave. And here's Dave. So if we want to get any functions, we can either click on API help, which will bring us to this page. And in this page, I can hit command and F and we can search for get cursor. So it'll give us a few results. Since we want to get cursor position, let's check out this function. When I click on it, it'll scroll down to where this function is. And this is it right here. So the things you see in normal text here, that's the name of your function. That's how you call the function in your script. What you see in italics, italics, that is what the function will return and everything inside the brackets is what the function needs as arguments. So as we can see, this function itself doesn't have any arguments. But if we look, for example, at this function below, Reaper get displayed media item color two, we can see that it's asking for two things as an argument. And on the left right here, we can see what it returns. So it returns an integer to us. Arguments also come in all shapes and colors, and we'll cover these as we go. But basically, once I have this function, I can just copy it from here or better yet, I can go back to Reaper. And in this window, I can also type in whatever I want. So I can go Reaper, get cursor position. And as you can see, as we type, it'll give us some results that match our search. Cursor position is what I want. And all the same information you get in the API help, you can also get here. So as you can see, no arguments are required and the script will then return a number to us. So just to finish the script, I will simply close the bracket. And now this function is ready to get the cursor position. So in order to save and run the action, I can just hit command and S and it will say save then recompile then voila, nothing happened. Well, actually something did happen. So even though this window lives in Reaper, when Dave is completely blank, Dave has no way of communicating with Reaper. It doesn't see all the stuff that we see on screen here. So I know where my cursor position is. I know that I currently don't have any tracks and I know that I'm right now not playing, but Dave doesn't know any of this. We need to tell Dave some stuff. So by simply putting this function here and running it, Dave knows now where the cursor position is, but we have not exactly received any sort of indication that anything happened. So once again, if we had to translate this conversation to English, it'll go a little something like this. Hey Dave, can you get the cursor position from my project? Yes. 
So pretty lackluster up to this point. But now that Dave is aware of where our cursor position is, we can now ask Dave for that number in a future function. So since this function is returning a number, let's see what that number is. Because the way Reaper communicates the cursor position to us is by showing us this line. But it communicates that to Dave using a number. So let's see that number and see what it is. And whenever we want to grab something that a function returns and do something else to it, we need to give it some sort of a unique identifier. And we do this by going to the beginning of the line putting an equal sign here and now I can say something like current cursor position so basically when we run this action Dave will get the cursor position from Reaper return it in the form of a number we will grab that number and call it current cursor position so in future functions we can now use current cursor position as an argument and Dave will provide the number that it assigned to this ID as an argument to the next function so one quite useful function to know is show console message once again let's look at this one let's expand this a little bit and as we can see needs one argument and that's a string message and in return it will show a message to the user and there's some additional information here like if we want a new line we have to type quotation marks forward slash n or we can just input an empty string to clear the console so a string argument is basically a text so current cursor position is itself not a text it's a number but if I now give this unique ID to the console message it would simply take whatever value this argument has and print it as a string meaning if it's a number it'll print the numbers as basically any kind of text and now we can save and run the action and the console will open here and it shows us 50.181818 and as we can see right here on our ruler our value is also 51818818 if I put my cursor somewhere else and run this again it'll give us the number 24 now it gave us that number right on the same line so what we can also do is call the function one more time and this time we will say put a new line there so every Every time we run the action a new line is created and then the current cursor position is pasted on that new line so let's run it one more time and now it goes 24 if I move the cursor somewhere else run it again now it's at 61.0909 and here on a ruler it says 10109 so we can also see that this number is in pure seconds so as a challenge to myself and all of you let's try to figure out by next month how to take this value and make it be in measures and beats and see if we can do it so the Rea script console output is really useful whenever you're not really sure what happened in a script and you want to check it out so when Dave just had one line in it we weren't really sure what exactly it's doing so by assigning an ID to its return and then printing that I now at least have an idea of what this return is and I can now use it in another function so for example let's bring in another function let's say we want to move the edit cursor so let's go reaper dot edit and here we go set edit cur pause let's click on this and once again up here we can can see that the set edit cur pause requires three arguments one of them is a number and two of them are boolean arguments and this time as we can see the function doesn't actually return anything what it returns is the thing that it does i.e setting the edit cursor position so the first arguments is asking for is a number so this number can be an absolute value so for example i can put zero in here and that will set our edit cursor to the beginning of our project or it can be a relative value so since dave knows where our position currently is i can have this current cursor position as our time and i can for example add one to it to move our edit cursor to the right now we can't do this yet because we also need to provide two boolean arguments for this function to have all the information it needs and the simple way to think of a boolean argument is like it was a yes or no question so dave will ask us two questions in a minute we can answer one for yes and we can answer zero for no now what these boolean questions are can be a bit cryptic at times so if you're not sure really the quickest way to test is by just inputting zero and one as both of these arguments and seeing what what happens in this case the questions are pretty straightforward so once again let's translate this conversation from Lua into English so in the first line I'm going hey Dave can you get the cursor position and then call it current cursor position Dave says yes so then I go can you now move the edit cursor position Dave goes where to and now I can tell it well take the current cursor position that you saved earlier and add one to it Dave goes okay and now here comes the extra questions. Should I move the view? Let's say yes. Should I seek? Let's say no. Now it has all the arguments it needs. So now if I save and run this action, boom. As we can see up here in the ruler, it is moving the cursor position. And every time the location it's moving to is off screen, it'll move the screen as well. If my answer to Dave's first Boolean question was no, then the edit cursor is still being moved 
but our view is not being moved at all. But if I zoom out, you can see that it's there and I can keep running the action and it'll be in my view until it's not. I'll talk more about what Seek Play does in the blog, but in the interest of time, let's now move on. Now, what's super duper cool is that right now we just ask Dave to add one to the number of the cursor position that it got from this function. And similarly, if I put minus one here, Dave will bring the edit cursor back by one second. So in essence, we use the return from one function to provide an argument to the next function. And when I run Dave, it starts reading from its first line and keeps going down. So by the time it gets to the second line, it already knows what this value is, and then it can plug that into the argument for the next function. Now the return of this function doesn't need a name because it's just doing something for us. So it can take absolute numbers. So for example, I can say zero and then answer one to move view. When I run this, it'll bring our edit cursor position to the beginning of the process project or as we had before this value can be relative to for example the current cursor position like this you know we can add 1 or 0 0.1 to this but what's cool is instead of adding an absolute number we can definitely use the return of another function here as well so i can ask dave to get the cursor position and then move it right by the duration of our time selection right that could be something cool so if our time selection is currently 24 seconds dave will then just plug 24 seconds in here and move it by 24 seconds if i then reduce this to 16.36 seconds then dave will move it forward by that so once again homework assignment until next month see if you can figure out how to modify the script to get the cursor position then get the time selection length and then move the cursor position by the length of time selection just as an exercise for now let's save and close dave and move on to the next example so let's one more time create a new real script and let's call this one beth why not and here's beth get fx envelope and here it is right here this function takes four arguments one of them is a boolean argument two of them are integer arguments and one of them is a track meaning it's an object since we don't have a track let's create a couple of tracks here so we already know what a boolean argument is let's talk about integer arguments so integer arguments are just that so these arguments will accept any whole number but they will not accept numbers like 1.53 and they will also not accept a string as an argument like a line break or a hello world these are also index numbers meaning the numbers start from zero so let's say on these tracks i have an eq and on this eq i can go to the param and i can go to the effects parameter list and we can see all the parameters of this plugin so from a human point of view the first parameter is bypass the second one is mid side mode on the third parameter is character the fourth parameter is input gain however from the lua perspective with the index this will be the zeroth parameter this will be the first this will be the second and this will be the third this will be the same in many programming languages where it starts counting from zero whereas us humans usually start counting from one so if i eventually want to use beth to get Get the fourth parameter of this plugin i will need to use the number three for parameter index so as we can see here we have four arguments here and one return this function will return to us a track envelope and in order to get that track envelope for us it needs to know which track it's on it needs to know which plugin on that track it's on and it needs to know which parameter in that plugin that envelope will be and it finally asks us a yes or no question so let's one more time translate this into english so we go, hey, Beth, can you get an effects envelope for me? And Beth goes, well, which track is it on? Also on that track, which effect is it on? And also in that effect, which parameter is it? And finally, it asks us a yes or no question. So Boolean create means if that envelope doesn't exist, should I create it or not? So if we answer one to that, it will create that. So let's get to these one by one. Since indexes start counting from zero, the first plugin that you have on any track will be the zeroth effects. So our second argument here will be zero, and I put a comma here. The next argument is parameter index, and as we said, input gain, which is what we wanted to run, was the fourth parameter in human speak. So in Lua speak, it'll be the third parameter, zero, one, two, three. If it doesn't exist, do we want it created? Let's say yes. Now, the only thing missing is this media TR our track. So this one is not a string argument, it's not an integer argument, and it's not a Boolean question. This is an actual media track. So this is a great opportunity to have the return from another function provide an argument for our next function. So I'm going to put this on line two, and in line one, let's go reaper get selected 
track. We want whatever track we created to be the track Beth will eventually get us an effects envelope from. And get selected track itself will return us a media track, which is perfect since we need a media track. And in order to get that track, it'll ask us for a project and it will ask for an integer, selected tracks ID. As we can see right here, it says get a selected track from a project, project zero for active project. So perfect. Let's put zero as a first argument by selected track count zero based. It starts counting from zero. So if I want the first track that I selected to be here, I just put zero here and we can close brackets. And now this function has all the arguments it needs to return to us a media track. We need to name this media track. So I can call this first selected media track. And now when Beth returns that media track, it'll give it this ID. I can now take this ID and copy it down here paste it. And now this function has all the arguments that it needs. So let's run it and see what happens. It took track four. It then went to its first effect on that effect, went to the fourth parameter. And since we said, yes, create a new effects envelope, if it exists, it created it. If I select another track and do the same thing, it says save and recompile, but you actually have to click back into Reaper for it to take effect. So I'm clicking back into Reaper and here it is. If our answer to the last Boolean question was no, meaning zero, when I run this action, Beth will simply grab that effects parameter, but it wouldn't do anything to it. So let's say one once again and run it. And this time we can see that it says bad argument number one, media track expected. So since we didn't have anything selected, this script didn't work this time. So let's select track two this time and run it. And as I click over here, we can see that envelope lane was also opened. So now I have both Dave and Beth open here. And like we said earlier, for the first function on both of these scripts, we are given a unique ID to what the first function returns so that we can use it in the second function. These unique IDs are called variables. There are local variables and there are global variables. Right now, both of these are global variables. But if I come here and I add local space to each of these, they will become local variables. So local variables are only valid in the script that they are housed in and they won't be available in any other scripts. This is actually a good thing, especially if you're a noob, because first of all, when we have local variables, I can then go to other scripts and still use this current cursor position unique identifier in another script without messing anything up or without it possibly containing a value that wasn't actually the value we were after. And also we're making sure that we're not breaking any other scripts by using a global variable. So at least until we really, really know what we're doing. I think it's best to define all your variables as local variables so that they only work in the script that you're working in and you would avoid the risk of possibly breaking another script in Reaper. In future episodes, we will of course see where a global variable would be more appropriate. But for now, let's just stick to local. So to recap, we use functions to ask our scripts to return something to us or to do something for us. And in order to do this, they may ask for certain information from us, which we call arguments. Arguments can be input manually, or we can call additional functions that can return the required arguments for the next function once they get their arguments provided to them. And round and round and round we go. When you run a script, it starts executing the commands from the top. For each function, it'll then check if it has all the arguments arguments that it needs. And if it does, we'll then return something. If that function's returns are to then be used as arguments in another function, then we can give the return of those functions a unique identifier and simply provide that identifier as an argument in the next function. As we run the script, each identifier stores whatever the function it's assigned to returns. And when called upon as a function in another argument, we'll return whatever it has stored under that unique identifier, which could be a string, a number, or even something like a reaper track or an item or an effects envelope. Eventually, once the script has gone through all the functions and acquired all the arguments that it needs, it will then do something for us, which will be the end result of the script. If at any point the script runs into a function without having all the required arguments, or if the arguments provided are yet undefined, then we get an error. If not, it will move on to the next function and so on and so forth. Also remember that we only need to assign IDs to functions if we are using their returns elsewhere in the same function. Otherwise, simply input 
setting the argument required for the function to work is enough for it to run and for the script to return something to us. But unless we define it to use later or do something to it, the return is simply obtained. And we may not see any kind of response or any indication that the function actually ran. Now there are many types of arguments and in this tutorial we saw examples of integers, strings, numbers, boolean and object arguments. These are not all the types of arguments that we will see but we will run into them in the future and explain them as they come. So that's it for today. Check out the blog post for more information and links as usual. Here are the challenges that I set for myself for the month of July. If you want to play along please do and please share with me all your findings. You can also join me and Leandro Facchinetti, my current scripting guru, on a live scripting tutorial every Tuesday at 1.30 Eastern time where we try to write scripts from scratch and you can also join us and ask your questions and give us your ideas. So if you've missed those, make sure to check them out. We try to do a lot of fun stuff there. From this week, I will also be joining Leandro on his channel every Wednesday at 1.30 p.m. Eastern time. So if you want to know what we're going to get up to there, join us. And as always, all the relevant links will be in the description. If you can't make it to the live streams, you can also comment any of your questions under this video or any of the other videos, and I will collect all of them and make sure to have them answered in one of the live streams. Please help support me and Leandro by subscribing to us. And if you can donate to us, all the links will be in the description. Take care of yourselves and I'll see you next month. Bye bye.